Anyone? Apologies come first, so do bear with me. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, now, I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's event. Uh, Merrill candidates, where do they stand on the environment? Now, my name's Anton Drazovic, and I'll be your host for this evening. Uh, but to start off, I'd like to get a karakia underway. Um, Anika, would you be able to help us out? Tēnā <laughs> Thank you, Anika. All right, to start off with, we'll just do a bit of housekeeping. All right, in the, uh, first of all, toilets. Now, toilets are actually just out, if you exit through the rear door, there's a toilet block across the road, so we'll please ask you to use that one. The reason the toilets are not open on the side here is because we have to pay for them to be cleaned and we're an NGO. So wherever we can save a penny, we will. So, thank you. Um, the, in, the, in the unlikely event of the following, if there is an earthquake, drop and take cover till the shaking passes. Please exit the building. There's two exits, one on the side, one at the back. And if we could please just congregate on the grass to the side. Um, following on from that, in the unlikely event that we have a tsunami, calmly exit the building, we'll walk to the front gates, and we're actually going to walk up the hill behind us, um, up Walter's Bluff. <laughs> I'm glad that you like the joke. Um, lastly, um, if there is a fire, calmly exit the building and meet at the assembly point which is just on the grass out the front of the building on the side there. Uh, we have two wardens so if anything happens you'll see them waving their arms around and you'll just follow them out the building. Right. Next. Now how the event will run this evening. Uh, we'll quickly go through uh, some introductions of our panel and of our candidates up here. Um, Questions have already been flowing into the panel, which they're quickly working through now. The panel will select the questions, and they will ask to the can will ask the questions to the candidates. The candidates will then raise their hand if they choose to answer the question, and it's going to be a little bit of the uh, the quick and the dead here. So the first candidate to raise their hand uh, more than likely will get chosen to answer the question. I ask the candidates to respect me when I think who's going to answer the question. My objective is to give you all equal time behind the mic to educate the community about where you stand on the environment. So you'll see towards the end of the evening, I might be selecting particular candidates who haven't had the same amount of time. We want to make this equal. Um, there will be a... Well, can you talk into the mic when you turn your head to one side and can't Oh, sorry, sir, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did say at the beginning, I am not a professional. <laughs> so, I, I, I... Oh, all right, all right, there we go. I do apologise, thank you, sir. All right, okay, so, so around 7 o'clock, we will break and have an intermission. Uh, there's beverages, tea, coffee, etc. Um, and it's an opportunity to have, for you to write some more questions. As you write them out, put them on the desk at the back and our team will ferry them up to the panel and they will select them as they come in. Um, it's also an opportunity to have a chat to any of the candidates as well, should you wish. Also, if the candidates, it's an opportunity for you to mingle with the, with the, the community as well. Um, at around 7.15, we'll call it quickly. We'll get the candidates back up there to, have, to continue the Q&A session. Alrighty. Now, I've done that and that, let me start off by introducing our panel. So, Debs Martin. 
Debs works for the Nature Conservancy as program manager of the KNTT Alliance, which is a conservation governance group for the top of the south, including DOC, Ely, and councils. Prior to this, for 17 years, Debs was top of the south manager for forest and bird. Uh, Debs has been awarded a Queen's Service Medal for service to and for conservation. Thank you, Debs. Uh, next on the panel. Uh, next, I'd like to thank Anika Young. Anika works for Nati Rarua, if I said that correctly, in the environmental team. She is an environmental scientist at the Cawthorn Institute. Uh, she sits on a range of governance boards, Marais, DOC, Project Janssen, and for local Ewe. Thank you. Uh, Next, we have David Eyre. David is coordinator of the science group and a member of the leadership group of the Nelson Tasman Climate Forum. Uh, David has been a, a Nelsonian since 1985. His professional background um, is in science, IT, and education. Thank you for joining us, David. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to welcome Nate Wilborn. Nate is 14 years of age, goes to Garen College. Nate is a coordinator of the Forest and Bird Nelson Tasman Youth Club and is passionate about the environment. Thanks for joining us, Nate. Okay, now over to our candidates. To start off with, the candidates, in alphabetical order, will have three minutes to introduce themselves and what they would like to share with us about their positions and poli proposed policy for the environment. Uh, Matt, would you like to start? Am I on? I'm not on. Just flick the switch on the microphone, we might have to turn it off. There you go. Kia ora, that's on. Hi. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa, ko Matt Laurie Aho. I'm Nelson City Councillor Matt Laurie. I'm a third term Nelson City Councillor. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you to all of you for being here. It is great to see people taking an interest in this election. So, very quickly, I want to tell you a story. About 17 years ago, and I say 17 years ago because our eldest son is 16, I played football on Victory Square one Wednesday night. I was training. And it was cold, and it was dark, and the air was thick. It was kind of soupy. It was kind of Dickensian. And I went home to where we were renting, up here in Iwa Road, I got in the shower, and I started coughing. And I coughed up all this black gunk that had been in my lungs, that I had sucked up into my lungs from playing football here in Nelson Whakatū on a Wednesday night. And the reason is because in winter we had some of the worst air quality in an urban area in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It was horrible. And we had been that way for a long time. But what we did, with a lot of encouragement from the government and legislation, is we got bold and we tackled our air quality problem in South Nelson. And now the air is massively improved. And I tell you the story because it is so important that we remember that as human beings, we have some power. We can actually change things. We can protect our environment. We can actually reverse damage that we have done to our environment. I think it's very important we remember these things because it can be overwhelming. And when you look at the impact of climate change on our city over the last three weeks, it's easy to get despondent, but we've got to remember the positive stories and we have to remember our power. And then we have to have a list of things that we need to do. So we need to reduce emissions, for sure. And we can do it. We've got active transport, we've got EVs, we can walk, we can ride a bike, we can do that. We need to protect the Mai Tai from forestry, from urbanisation. We need to improve the water quality coming out of the dam. We can do all those things. We need to look after, promote and invest further in our incredible sanctuary. The sanctuary is one of the gems in the city and it is going from strength to strength. It can just get better and better. So we have the power to do that. And we have to do something about cats. 
we actually have to snip and chip our cats. We have to put microchips in them so we can tell the wild cats from the domestic cats and we have to snip them so that they don't create wild cats. These are all things that we have the power to do and if you elect me mayor, I will work very hard to make them all happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And most importantly, thank you for keeping it to three minutes. Because well done. That, that's a win. We're starting with a win, team. All right. Uh, Kerry, yeah. over to you. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I think I will take the hand, Mike, seeing you're having problems with that. Thing. Awesome. Okay. If that's all right with you. Absolutely. Just, you just pull it up. Yeah. Okay, folks. Great to be here, and the first thing I did, of course, as a carpenter and builder, was that have to look up in the beautiful timber work up in the building there. This one is, you probably know where this building originated from, but, uh, but for those who don't, it came from the uh, Catholic Church in Manuka Street. It was the convent, I think, wasn't it up there? Anyway, a little bit about myself. Um, if you want to find out of details of what I've been presenting around the town in the last few weeks, you can find the details on Facebook under my name. And uh, I'm a bit of lightheartedness here. Um, I'm the only genuine environmentalist, environmentalist I think, uh, Anton, here on the stage. I haven't, uh, I haven't polluted the street sides with placards or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, I was a, I'm a, I was a three-term councillor back in the 70s and 80s when councillors were able to do things and if you're interested I've left a pile of uh, handouts over there on the uh, desk of uh, a list of achievements that were that occurred back in that era when quite seriously councillors were hands-on today these people are handicapped because of the, the rules governing local government has restricted their uh, activity um, I co-authored a book with a cousin of mine, some of you would have remembered Nola Leo, on the, uh, some of the history around the area, particularly around the Marlborough Sounds. Um, had a lifetime in construction, during which, this is a bit of interesting background, four properties were taken from uh, our family by the state that were in uh, Beetson's Road for the Southern Link. <laughs> back in 1954, would you believe? So it's 68 years ago since that proposition first was mooted. We haven't moved very far, have we? Um, I've got a new thriving um, um, swan plant at home, which is a track monarchs, and I've discovered that uh, dishwashing liquid and a bit of uh, water gets rid of the aphids very well, so, uh, so have a go at that if, you, if you're interested. I've also discovered a, a childhood uh, uh, um, um, thing I wanted to, uh, a dream of uh, playing down on the river now that I'm living by the Mai Tai, but quite seriously, thank you, I'm a little concerned about the eels eating the baby ducks, so there's a bit of conflict going on there. And um, finally, I'd like to say that I think it would be nice if the schools or the churches could get involved in welcoming the Godwits to Nelson every year. I'm sure, I'm sure that that would take on quite well, as it does in other parts of the world. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Kerry. And that's two for two, so I really appreciate keeping the time. Brian, what would you like to speak to this? Kia ora koutou katoa, ko Whirongia, te maunga, ko Waipa, te awa, ko Tainui, te waka, ko Ngati Apakura, te iwi, ko Rohana Neil Stevens, taku ingoa. Kia ora everyone, I'm Rohana, I'm one of your Nelson City Councillors and I want to start by thanking everyone uh, for coming out tonight for what is a really crucial issue. We are facing significant challenges within the environmental space, from biodiversity loss to widespread environmental degradation, a loss of water quality, and a growing risk of flooding and damage from climate change and sea level rise. Now, for the past three years, I've been working incredibly hard in this space, 
uh, drafting resolutions that committed Nelson City Council uh, towards a carbon neutral stance and continuing that work towards the development of community-wide emissions reduction goals and a plan for us to get there. I've worked in the public transport space and the transport space more widely to make sure that we are decarbonising as quickly as we can because this is not an issue that can wait. I've worked with the wonderful councillor Rachel Sampson and other councillors to progress a common sense approach to the management of our city's forestry holdings and forestry more widely. Uh, we've signed off on our climate action plan which is the first steps in progressing genuine change for our city to be one that is in balance with nature. Now simply the reason I'm standing for Mayor is because I want to continue this mahi. And, we, and I want to continue bringing our city towards a vision where we are in balance with our wider environment and where we're allowing it not just to survive alongside us but actually to flourish and to thrive. And that means supporting things like the Brook Waimarama Sanctuary. It means supporting a whole lot of the organisations that are represented here. But it also means ending practices which we are currently doing which are damaging our environment and our city as a whole. We should be proud of what we pass down to future generations. And right now I think it's safe to say we can't be proud of the environment that would be handed down. But that is something that we can change. Together we can ensure that the planet we pass down is one we're proud of. And that when our grandkids and their grandkids ask what we did, we can say that we made real tangible change to the way we do, did things to make sure that they can enjoy our wonderful Mai Tai River, that they can collect seafood without stressing about it and that they know that their climate is in safe hands. So thank you very much and I look forward to the discussion. Kia ora. Thank you very much for that. Richard. Thanks very much, Anton. Thank you for organising this, you guys, and thanks very much for coming. That's the second best audience I've seen so far. My name's Richard Osmiston, and I'm running for six mayoralties in the top of the South Island. The reason I'm doing that is because I think we need to up our game a bit. These are great people. I've seen great people from Hokitika to Greymouth to Tasman. They're fantastic. They work flat out. You won't get better people. Frankly, it doesn't make much difference. These people, they've got a long history of experience. They are marionettes. They are puppets to capitalism. And they have overseen the destruction of this fabulous country. It's not their fault. The system is completely broken. It's completely corrupt. <clears throat> I'm proposing that we abandon the monetary system entirely if we want to survive. There is what's called a resource-based economy where everything is free and everything is voluntary. That is pivotal. Everything is voluntary. And in a voluntary society, nobody can control you from outside, from City Hall, from Wellington, from America, from London. No. We control what we do. We will get what we want. Right now, it all comes from somewhere else, doesn't it? And it ain't working. And we can shift the chairs around on the deck of the Titanic and it ain't good enough. Ask a 12 year old, it's not even that hard. My previous career, I, worked, I first stood for Nelson in 2013 by the way with exactly this topic and I've just watched the whole thing go to crap. In my previous career as an airline pilot and as a licensed aircraft engineer, in that environment we have systems that have integrity and right now there's a million people airborne in airliners and they're safer than we are in this hall here because of the systems the systems we are capable of producing systems that have integrity this system does not have integrity it relies upon exploitation consumption growth hierarchy and it ain't working and the results are there for us all to see if we want to fix climate if we want to take care of our environment then we have to change to a system that supports positivity and not consumption, exploitation and misery, which is what we see. And we could do so much better. Thank you.
Thank you, Richard. Tim, over to you. Very good. I feel about to sing. Hey, welcome everyone. I see some good faces out there, people I know, and uh, I commend the candidates we have here standing for mayor. I've been watching some of the uh, elections going on around the country, and I reckon this is the best looking bunch in the country. Hey, many of you already know me. I've always stood very clear on my principles. I've always been very consistent and dependable on my voting. I've never stood on the fence nor abstained from the tough topics. I've been on council for nine years. I've looked after a chair of, of several committees and I greatly think this gives the experience to hit the ground running as mayor for the city and getting this town back up to speed where it should be. Having formed relationships over those nine years, both within council and outside of council, with various organisations, iwi, business groups and communities. Nelson, by, by providing those relationships, I think we've got to look at Nelson as a greater region, both with Tasman and the top of itself, and upon that we can champion very hard against the government in any of those decisions where I feel they've left out the needs of our diverse community. I continue to make great strides in our sports and recreational facilities and needs. I've picked up this term, the reins of our art, heritage and culture, and ensure we've got some great strategies moving forward, and I want to take those a lot further. Two major ethos underline my decision making as a councillor. One is ensuring the mental and physical well-being of our community and making sure there's the participation of it all, regardless of the activities undertaken. The other one is the environmental ethos. As we continue to protect our native forests, but I think our marine, we've got a great marine area, some marine reserves, and you're looking up between Pepin Island, Delaware Bay, the Back Beach, etc. Those are areas I think are greatly overlooked. Much of this you've seen as evident in my decision making and in the community gardens, self-sustainability, in regards to our backdrops to our forests up here, you'll see with our forest, our pine exotic up the brook, I've been very much involved in our parks and reserves for returning those to native and for recreational areas, and I very much want to continue that work heading into the Mai Tai areas. I think a lot of those forestry, a lot of it is, some of it is Nelson, some of it's Kawata, but I'd like to return much of that back to native and build a relationship with Kawata. We're quite a major shareholder in the land up there, and there's much of collaboration we can do there. So for me to continue that work, which I'm very passionate about for Nelson, I need your support in voting. This is to make Nelson a new mayor, a new council, a better Nelson going forward. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you, Tim. And now, Nick, if you'd like to join us. Kia ora hui tata katoa. A uh, real pleasure to join you this evening. Can I firstly acknowledge Anton and the Nelson Environment Centre? One of the things that we should be hugely proud of as Nelsonians is that our Environment Centre was the very first in the country and that uh, during my time as Minister for the Environment was able to pick up that idea from Nelson and spread that network uh, through the country. Uh, my passions in life is firstly science, secondly enterprise and third is the environment and I've been privileged in this country a couple of times as Minister of Conservation best job in the cabinet room and a couple of times as Minister for the Environment uh, to put that passion uh, to work. In the 15 months that I've been out of Parliament uh, I've been the project manager on New Zealand's largest wind farm at Turatea. Uh, and our family company has just secured the contract for building New Zealand's second biggest wind farm in the Hawke's Bay, of which I've got some meetings later this week. Those two wind farms will produce sufficient electricity for over 300,000 homes and over 400,000 electric cars, and will reduce New Zealand's emissions by over a million tonne a year. And I mention those because they are the sort of practical things that I am passionate about if I'm privileged to be your mayor. That is, I think the council has done some good work on climate change, 
but there's been too much of the bold statement and too little of the practical actions in which our council can make a difference. Now in three minutes I can't tell you all the things I would like to do and there's a piece of paper down the back with 12 specific initiatives. But let me just mention a few of those. It is mad that we in the city are still burning coal, 500 tonne a year of it, at Nelson Hospital. Why doesn't the council pass a resource management air discharge rule to phase it out within three years? I will push that if I am mayor. If I am mayor, I want to see us extend the home insulation program and provide the funding to do that. It's a no-brainer to help on all fronts with the trust. On different environmental issues, we have the Brook Sanctuary here and the vision of having Kiwi and Tuatara back in this part of the world is a project that I want to be part of. And the last really big one, where is it that Nelson can really shift the dial for New Zealand and the world? I tell you it's around oceans. And that vision of at our port with the Cawthron Institute, a world leading education, science and environmental section around the oceans is one of the things I want to advance if I'm privileged to be your mayor. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nick. Now, unfortunately, John, uh, the seventh candidate, is not able to join us this evening. Um, and in a fair and equal democracy, I will read out the text that he has sent through. Uh, I'm no, by no means endorsing the text that he has sent through. Tell the public I'm going to fire all the individuals that waste rates. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, they are, yes. Uh, now, hey, I just want to thank all the candidates for their speeches so far, and most importantly, thank you all for keeping time. That is bloody great, because this gets to the pointy bit of the evening that we're all waiting for, and that's the opportunity for the candidates to answer the questions from the community. Now, I just want to frame, I have, I'm not involved with the, the questions at all. The questions are from yourselves, I uh, filtered through the panel of our experts there, and it is the panel that will ask the questions. The candidates will then put up their hand if they'd like to answer it, and then I'll select the candidate to respond to that question. I just want to remind you that you only have two minutes to respond. You'll see my lovely team member Mark in the front row will start indicating when you run out of time. Great. All right, over to you, Debs. Oh, well, kia ora. Um, this is a, a great opportunity to ask you some very good questions that are coming through from the floor. And I will just say, um, Mr Chair, that we have a number of questions that are coming through to the floor. We probably aren't going to get through all of them tonight. But um, uh, if you do have a question and it's specifically related to one of the candidates, we encourage you to take that opportunity in the break to ask your question directly of them. But the first question that we have off the block tonight, we have caused our climate and biodiversity crisis and addressing it requires a diversity of perspectives. If you are elected Mayor, how will you work to create a supportive culture around the council table to ensure that diverse perspectives and fresh ideas are supported? Richard was first up on that one. Matt, I'll give you a chance to jump in after Richard. Richard, please begin. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, we're all about diversity. Um, <laughs> of course, you can't just turn things around with one good idea. We have to bring everybody on board. But as we become rapidly aware of the dilemma that we have, I think we're in a much more open framed frame of mind now. And so the natural tendency is actually, provided we don't go into a fear and shut down mode, we are all in a better place to listen to some different ideas. And I think the history of our demise actually proves that. Um, as mayor, I think day-to-day -day business of the council has to continue as it has. You know, they generally do a very good job actually, but the conversations have to change. And with somebody like myself, I mean, I do accept that my perspective is quite a long way out there. And anything in between my position 
and the conventional one is very welcome. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. So, if, as Mayor, if I'm fortunate enough to be given the role, one of the things that we're working very hard to do is to create a collaborative, respectful, and tolerant culture at Council so that people can actually challenge the status quo without fear of being crushed. And what happened to Rachel Sanson in the last term of council, in my opinion, has actually been a stain on democracy in Nelson Whakatū. I think it is important that we have these hard, decision, hard conversations and we have to accept that we're not all going to agree with each other about the way forward, but we've got to give people the opportunity to bring new ideas to the table. We have got to respect people when they do that. And I think a culture that does that will help move us forward. Thank you, Matt. That was awesome. Uh, James, would you like to ask the next question? David. Okay. okay. Significant weather events. And we all know what that means. Climate change is increasing the frequency and severity of significant weather events here and everywhere else. What are I'm your priorities? You. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, David. Could you please speak up? Or Ben will help you. So if you please repeat the question from the beginning. Okay. okay. Climate change is increasing the frequency and severity of significant weather events. We all know what that means recently. What are your priorities for future-proofing our region against these? Rohan? Yeah, thanks for the uh, question, and it's probably one of the most important discussions we'll be having in the next uh, few years. And as much as I can give my priorities, what's actually really crucial in these processes is using the tools that we already have, things like our dynamic adaptive pathways, um, and engaging with all of you and our whole community to establish the values and approach that we're going to take. If we want our adaptation to be successful, it actually can't just come from council. This has to be a process that's co-designed with the entire community, and particularly with the areas affected. That being said, we've already started some of this work around river flooding, around coastal inundation, and those are the two key areas I'm keen to continue to progress in the next term, uh, but really ramping that up, because unless we have a plan, we don't have any certainty for our future, and that degree of uncertainty uh, is doing some very real harm in our community already, and the stresses from that are only going to get worse. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. I think we need to be very upfront with the community that the scale of the repairs from the August events are likely to be tens of millions of dollars and dominate the work program for our council for about the next 18 months. Uh, and I've set out uh, five points that we need to do to do that repair well. And a really critical part of that work is ensuring that we build more resilient. Now, to the council credit, if I look at some of the storm damage from 2010 in areas like Cable Bay, the engineering work stacked up, and those areas that were stood, it's been new years that have been broken. And then there's that second piece of work, and that is around how do we manage long term uh, the impacts of climate change, uh, because while we've got the job to mitigate and reduce the emissions, there is already change that's built in the system and that's about having that community conversation and planning of which there are some things our council is doing poorly but actually we need to give credit where credit's due the work that's going into adaption in my view is good work and if i'm being privileged to be mayor we'll continue that work thank you mayor. Uh, Anna, would you like to ask the next question Awesome. <laughs> Kia ora um, So I'll start my little list of questions with a really controversial one to get the night going. So cats. 
Feral cats are a problem in our reserves, and control of them is made difficult by not being able to distinguish feral cats from people's pet cats. Do you support compulsory microchipping and desexing of cats in Nelson? Yes. I, I have a very passionate Matt here waiting to respond to that question. So, one of the things I'm really proud of from this last term of council is I, with support of um, council colleagues, got it to the point where council officers had to go and do a report on the options for us making chipping and snipping mandatory in Nelson Whakatū. And that work is ongoing and the next council will be presented, because of the mahi we did, with options for doing just that. And that will be a big step forward because not a lot of councils around the country have the guts to do it. But we should do it. We should absolutely do it. And I'll tell you something else we should do. We should probably have a little bit of a think about the number of cats that you can have per property. Because at the moment we have no rule. You can have as many cats as you like on your property. And I think that's pretty strange in this day and age. There's a limit on the number of dogs you can have, but not cats. And check it out. You can have as many cats as you want on your property, and your property can be right next to the Brook Waimarama Sanctuary. In my opinion, that's nuts. If I'm mayor, I'll try and change that. Thanks very, thanks very much, Matt. Good, uh, good that Matt, Matt's using my kind of language, nuts. You're damn right, mate. Some 12 year olds, I don't know, some little kids. You know, our world is crumbling around us. And I didn't actually get invited to a previous uh, Nelson mayoral meeting because I wasn't, I wasn't, in, I don't know, I wasn't important enough. I only took the more prominent, serious candidates. And I gather the first item was, again, cats. And I don't know, I, it just doesn't feel like we're on quite the right track when we're arguing about cats, when young people are killing themselves, we have an obesity epidemic, we are bankrupt, our climate is collapsing, our society is collapsing, and we're talking about pets and little bells. I mean, seriously, this is cognitive dissonance writ large, and I will personally have no part of it. Thank you, Richard. Now, panel, would you like to ask my next question? And I am going to warn Kerry and Tim, I'm expecting a hand to go up. Uh, just right oh, right. Huh? <laughs> Over to you, Anika. Sit down here okay. where I can hear it. Ko kia ora no koutou. Um, so this part I is uh, with respect to sedimentation, and in particular to Tai o Audi, the Tasman Bay. So the question is, Tasman Bay is already severely degraded due to the smothering effects of sediment carried from the land. How should council deal with sedimentation impacts in our marine environment? You know, I'm going to hand that to Tim Matterson. Hey, thank you for that question and that's been very evident with what's happened over the last few days. And I was, I was saddened to see, especially amongst the Delaware, Delaware Bay was about a half a foot of sediment there. But as I mentioned before, I've gone to great lengths up the, the brook, brick waterway there, and I've taken a lot of passion for that, being one of, was one of the cleanest rivers, creeks in an urban city, and uh, transforming that backdrop. But also the Mai Tai does need a lot of work. But sedimentation is very evident. Obviously you couldn't. There was not much you could do with the amount of storm we had just in the last few days. But when you look out at Tasman Bay, discoloration, I enjoy my fishing, the kayak fishing, you might have seen that article in the uh, hunting and fishing magazine the other day, but it does concern me greatly on that. But it's something I think as a, a region that we need to get on top of, top of the self, it's not something just we as a council, it's partnering with a lot of those other landowners, but a greater region. When you look at the top of the self, it's a beautiful area and sedimentation, uh, I don't have all the answers, but it is something we've got to really look at. And then maybe in regards to stormwater, I think with a lot of our development happening with stormwater, it's filtering out that what flows straight into the creeks. You saw it was gushing out with a huge amount of rain. If we can filter some of that before it hits those creeks and rivers, that's one big step towards that. Hey, but thank you very much. But it also comes down to people's personal properties. Make sure they're nice and secure as well as um, 
plantations, etc. But the public, to, to, to say that, I think the community have taken on that very well, and we as a council will need to step up our game greatly. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Over to you, Gary. Mike. Thank you. Yeah, very important question. Historically, of course, Nelson's very accustomed to rain events and big storms. Uh, the last one that I've got a photo of, or the first one I've got a photo of, is 1931, which was exactly the same height as the one the other day. 1970, 52 years ago, a very severe one ripped heck out of the brook and the top of the uh, Nile Street zone there in a big way, and of course houses fell off the road, off the uh, hill, and so on. But in an attempt to uh, answer your question, I uh, rafted down the Mai Tai from Shalins Creek right down to the end here a year or so ago, and I was um, quite disturbed to see that there were parts of the river that we could hardly negotiate in a rubber dinghy because of the growth from the large trees that have been allowed to develop up more around the Shalins Creek area. So this time, obviously, that rain event occurred and, 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 uh, and thank you, and uh, grabbed these trees and ripped them out of the bank and threw them down the river and pulled a lot of sediment with it. So I'm not helping you really with the, 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 the solution to this problem, but I can tell you that that's, that that's what's happened, that what, that's what happens when we get a big event. Nelson also is quite accustomed to severe amounts of rain at one time. I mean, 50 mils, nothing. 75 is quite common, and 100 is not uncommon. So we've got this problem uh, with our topography, steep hills, uh, rapid flowing rivers, but finally, with development, of course, and I'm a developer, but with development, the speed of the water is so much faster in a, in a modern system, which is ripping the sides out of the rivers too, I guess. So we all better pack up and leave and let, let, the, let the place go back to its native state. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. Yeah, can you speak to the same question? Just quickly, because I think you deserve some actual solutions for this. Um, we're, we're not going to, to on our own, um, Tim's right, we're not going to solve the sedimentation issue in Tasman Bay, but we can do our part in it. And that means looking at the riparian margins along our waterways, expanding and enhancing them to reduce the amount of sediment entering them and then ultimately into Tasman Bay. It also means looking at the land use that we are allowing within our catchments, like uh, uniform clear cut or clear fell forestry, which is a huge contributor to sediment in all of our estuaries. These are things that we can control and there are things that we can do and we need a council and a mayor that is willing to do that. Here. Matt wants to jump in as well. Yeah, well, why not? I was going to say what that guy said. Um, but also, I need, I need you all to know something if you don't know it already. The number one cause of sedimentation in the Mai Tai Mahitahi River is forestry. And we lose sight of that. And we talk about how it's a taonga. And we, we talk about how we're going to protect it. But council is staying in a clear fell forestry game. And it needs to get out of it. Needs to get out of it to protect the Mai Tai, needs to get out of it to protect the Tasman Bay, and it morally, actually, in my opinion, has responsibility to do just that. The other thing we could do is we could actually take some of the impact out of the water that falls on our, our rooftops by having more people having water tanks, taking some of the water off that roof and stopping it from just smashing everything in its path. That's another thing we can do. The stuff we can do, we should do it. Thank you, Matt. I'm actually going to go to another question from the panel. Yep. Yeah. Panel, are you prepared for the next one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, oh, she turned it off. That, that was hot. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. In fact, my next question was going to be about forestry, but I'm not too sure that I will. So I'm going to ask something quite different. Um, and, and I'm asking this. I'm involved with Kotahi Tangamoti Taiao Alliance, which is an alliance between Dock Council and Iwi. Nelson City Council, of course, is a signatory to that alliance. 
and so used to working across boundaries. So I'm getting you to think a little bit bigger than Nelson City. Are you for or against the amalgamation of NCC and TDC? And how would this benefit the environment? I just want to say, bloody good question. Uh, Nick, would you like to answer this one? It is my view that the winds of change around local government are the strongest that they have been for about 20 or 30 years. And regardless of your view, what it might be on three waters, or the big changes in the RMA, or the future of local government review, my view is that Nelson and Tasman would be wise to get ahead of the pace and not wait for Wellington to do it to us, but actually for us to define the form of local government that is going to serve this community. And when I say this community, I say Nelson and Tasman, because we are uh, effectively an integrated community and what will work for us for the next period. And one of the things that has motivated me after a long career in parliamentary politics is to put my hand up for Mayor is having been Minister of Local Government, having been so many other different portfolios, is to apply my skills to get the right form of local government that can serve this community well for the next 25 odd years. And have another 30 years of devastation. Are you well, kidding? I don't believe me. No, no, that's not fair. Sorry, I'm begging you. Sorry. And, 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 and the only other part I'd say with it, there was a previous mayor that sort of tried to force merger on Tasman. It backfired. What we need to do is to have an honest and more inclusive conversation about what is going to work for both Nelson and Tasman if we're going to get the right sort of reform. Thank you. Now, hey, panellists, Richard, I'm just going to ask that we're going to have hot topics, and I ask that everyone respects each other with equal opportunity to speak. I'll ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak. My apologies, um, thank you. Appreciate that. Now, with that in mind, sorry, we are going to go with that question. We are going to go with that question. Yeah, Kerry, would you like the opportunity to respond to that? Yeah, yeah, that's my understanding. Is that what? Is that on, on amalgamation? Yeah. yeah. About 15 years ago, this area had a long discussion about it um, with Tasman. A commission sat in the uh, Richmond area. But our uh, determination as an organisation called the Nelson Residents Association at the time determined that as we could go with amalgamation, providing the hinterland is, has a degree of autonomy, as it is, they're pretty toothless out there. But if it became a bigger organisation, including Nelson, we would of course become just a sort of a ward <laughs> of the major major uh, uh, hub that would, would undoubtedly be around the Richmond area. So our view was that to be fair and, 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 and try and keep democracy to the fore, that the likes of Murchison, Takaka, Motawaka, and so on would, would have a chance to determine their own destiny more than they've got now, actually. So that was our position at the time, and it's mine as well, okay? So that's a no for you, Kerry? to the amalgamation, just to confirm. Kerry, that a, that's a no to the amalgamation? Sorry, Andrew. Was that a no? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Uh, this is, I'm actually going to progress with this question because I've got some passionate councillors here. Tim, would you like a moment? Yeah, for the amalgamation? Yes. Hey, thank you. I've made a bit of a shift on that. In my first two terms, I was dead against the amalgamation. I jealously wanted to look after Nelson in regards to our rates, etc. But to be honest, this term, with some of the challenges that come to us from central government and the growing challenges when you're talking about the environment, etc., um, I've seen some real synergies. I've been impressed with the two councils that have worked well together in some of their committees, like I'm on the, I'm the deputy chair of a sewage business unit, uh, Saxon Field, etc., and we work incredibly well together, despite what some of the public might say. And it may be a case of amalgamating some of those committees, but I think greater, for looking at that greater region, when you're looking at decisions like housing and transport, which do have an effect, a great effect on our environment, and housing, for example, I know Tasman have come to us a number of times and said, hey, can you please 
shoulder some of that load, and I know there's some uh, controversial topics coming up on that with, as, as, with respect to the Waimea Plains and our productive land, etc. So I think there definitely needs to be an amalgamation of views, etc. there. When it comes to our transport, I tend to think there's also a bit of a disconnect there. But by being amalgamated, not just with Tasman and Nelson on that thinking, but also including Marlborough, I'm not saying we amalgamate the councils of Marlborough, but amalgamate some of those committees and subcommittees, I think there's some real serious gains we can gain with our housing strategies, with our transport strategies, and with our environmental. And that might come down to those plantations, etc. But um, no, thank you for that. But uh, I think that's something that's going to evolve, and I think with a new council, they'll be able to come to that conclusion far stronger. And it will depend, obviously, the council of TDC. But yeah, no, thank you. Great question. Thank but that's an example of a, a shift thank in you. thinking. Yeah. Thank you. Are you. Matt, are you a yes yeah. or a no? Oh, yeah. 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 And the reason when it comes to the environment is, and I'm going to step a bit away, over here, just out of Richard's range, the reason, more money. If we are speaking as one district, we have a better chance of getting money out of Wellington for environmental projects, a much better position to be in than what we are doing right now. Two small councils putting our hand up, competing in some ways. If we can speak as one region, we will get more money for the environment out of the government, which has got to be a good thing. We will be able to get a better working transport system that will improve our emissions, our congestion, and the impact of transport on the environment. Uh, there are pluses for the environment through amalgamation. Thank you. Yep. All right, thank you, Matt. Now, it is uh, now uh, uh, time for our uh, intermission for this evening. We're going to take a 15 minute break. I'm going to be quite strict about this because this is about getting candidates to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, but in the 15 minutes, please help yourself to refreshments. We've got hot refreshments over there. We've got cold ones at the back. Uh, but just to remind you, toilets through the back door across the road. Uh, the candidates have the opportunity to grab a refreshment and mingle with the audience if they'd like. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Rohan. Um, I hope you've all got a drink and, and are ready for the next round. Now, candidates, I'm going to be a lot more uh, uh, focused this round to keeping you guys on point to answer the questions. So, uh, I, I don't know, we're, we're not criticising, we're just saying we want snappy answers, we want to know where you stand. And uh, the more questions we can get through, the more opportunity you have to convince the members of the audience here to vote for you. So it's in everyone's interest to be short, sharp and sweet. So I'm going to be a lot more encouraging uh, of you guys to answer the questions as they come out. Now, uh, over to you panel, I hope, oh, but Ben's telling me I'm not holding the, phone, the microphone properly, now I am. Uh, panel, could you please uh, get your next question ready and hopefully it's a pointy one. Over to you. Okay, key question, library. A lot has been made of the proposed library redevelopment sites of vulnerability to sea level rise, flooding and liquefaction. The current council appears confident that they can manage these risks. Do you think that proceeding with the current plan then commits Nelson to additional costs and other issues defending the site against flooding and sea level rise. Okay, so I just want to, I'm going to follow this up. We want to know what you think about the library. I know you're all going to want to have a crack at this one. So I'm actually going to take that you're all going to get one minute. All right, whoever wants to chance, one minute, but one minute only. And I'm actually going to start off with Nick on the far side. He was the first one with his hands up. Uh, Nick, the microphone's just here. Sorry, mate. I do not support the library proposal. Uh, the $46 million that started out for $12 million is too big a cost for our community. On the issue of the climate change risk, uh, that is an additional element, but with all buildings in such areas, you can if you spend enough money managing it, but that just drives up the cost for the current and the cost for the future. Uh, so my answer is no. If I'm privileged to be mayor, 
The first motion I will put to the council is to put the current proposal on ice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think most of you know where I stand on that. No, I do not support the library, uh, primarily for that financial uh, expenditure. But when it comes to environmental, if we're doing it for some sort of setting a standard of where you can beat nature, uh, Mother Nature's going to win. So I think, A, you can look elsewhere for building such thing, and B, I think there's more important stuff in regards to infrastructure. Thank you. Royal Tim, that's a no for Tim. Wow, how about this? I agree with the two previous speakers. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Over to Rohan. Yeah, look, so I've, I've spoken about the, the concept of civic investment and the cost of the library, but I do want to go into, uh, and you can find those, just search up Rohan Library, uh, but I want to talk about site vulnerability because that has been something that I've raised throughout this process alongside some other councillors. And the issue is, when we're building on a site that close to a river, we're, we're locking down other potential opportunities like expanding that riparian margin, like using that land to adapt and to uh, increase our resiliency from flooding. So again, what we need to do, particularly when we're looking at those vulnerable areas and talking about development, is go through the processes that we've already started to establish whether they're areas that we're going to protect or whether uh, they're gonna be areas that we may have to look towards a managed retreat or using that land for protection. So to confirm, Rohan, that's a no to the current mm, plan? Yes. A no to the current plan, but yes. <laughs> Thank you, Rohan. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. If you look on my Facebook page, you'll see that I did a uh, calculation what the actual building will cost on the basis of what we know, and we, we know very little. The person that's responsible right now for handling the project, a, uh, Alice Heather, says they haven't got a plan yet, it's in the media. Um, they drilled down in Burger King 35 metres to try and find a decent base there. Uh, the City Hall building is 31 metres, so you can see how far down they went. Um, <laughs> 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a dilemma because uh, do we need a library? Perhaps we do, but we certainly don't need it in that spot. And I'll leave you with this, that the climate emergency policy is corrupt. It's allowing this council to push this or promote this uh, library's nonsense at the same time telling 7,000 people to clear out, you've got to go to higher ground. I'm going to say that's a no for Richard. I'm also going to say I'm pro-library. So I just want to be really clear on that one. Uh, Matt. Thank you. So, um, yes to a new library. A, thank you. A, a, a city that does not invest in itself goes backwards. A city that does not invest in itself does not retain or attract talent, and it doesn't retain or attract young people. So yes to a library, but not necessarily at that price, and not necessarily at that location. But I, and this is one of the things you have to do when you're an elected representative. You have to keep an open mind to things. So I am trying to keep an open mind to the site at this stage. Thank you, Matt. Would anyone else like a... No, we're done. All right. Panel, can you please... Oh, I have an additional comment. Oh. No, you, have you got the next question ready? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So on um, public transport, a bus service between the airport and the CBD or at Waimea Road with potential stops at places like the hospital. Places like Whangarei, you can catch a bus from the airport to their CBD for only $2 per person, which is easy and affordable. What is stopping Nelson from having such a bus service from the airport? Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go Rohan and Matt. Um, any other candidates like to have a crack at this one? No? Absolutely nothing, and we're getting one from the 1st of July next year. Uh, we're getting a complete overhaul to our bus system, including flat fares, increased frequencies, so from before 7am until at least 7pm every 30 minutes, there will be a bus. This is one of uh, my proudest achievements in our term on the Regional Transport Committee, is we have invested significantly into our public transport system, and we know that that is going to massively increase 
the number of people using it. Uh, so bring on the 1st of July. Thank you, Rohan and Matt. And we can go further. And what I want to do is make the bus, the end bus, free for children, students, community services card holders, and total mobility card holders. Because you can have a great service, but if you don't develop and grow a culture of public transport use, you won't get the real rewards that can come with it. And we have to do that, because we don't have that history here. Young people actually quite like using the bus. If we can get them on the bus all the time, getting all over the city, when they turn into 18 year olds, they won't mind paying for it. You know, it won't cost a lot in the greater scheme of things. It will reduce congestion, it will reduce mums and dads driving their kids all over the show. It's a really good idea, we should do it. Yeah. Oh, Mason, Kerry, I, I want Nick to answer this question. Nick, do you want to tell us your position on public transport? Yeah. Who paid? Uh, public transport is clearly part of the answer, and the improvements programmed for the 1st of July are a good thing. I'm always a little bit sceptical of people who say that things are free, because someone always pays. And what you need to do is to make sure that where you are providing those subsidies, if they are lumped onto the rate power, you can hurt some of the very lowest income people in our community. So, to so interrupt you, Nick. Are you so, so in short, I do not think the ratepayer should provide the cost of all of the bus service. More that, broadly, that's transport. not the question, though. The yep. question is: Are you pre uh, for increasing bus services here yes. in Nelson? Yes. yes. Thank you. That's the question. Thanks. Yep. One brief question. Seeing this is supposed to be a debate, Mr. Moderator, to the two gentlemen beside me. I've heard that you're about to determine that the bus terminal will be in, Mill in Miller's Acre. Is that true? Uh, Kerry, I'm going to interrupt you. It's actually up to the panel down there to oh, ask the I'll questions. <laughs> so, like everyone else, feel free to write your question on a sheet down the back and the panel will decide if you'll answer. So, I'm going to interrupt that one. All right. Hey, panel, have you got the next question? Oh, Tim, did you want to jump in no. before I throw to the panel? No, I've got the next question. All right. Next question, please. Alrighty, um, so this question is about community input and, and just I suppose for, for you all it's important to have input in terms of making decisions for our tyre, for our environment. So anyway, the question is, a lot has been spoken this election about council transparency and increased community involvement. A Tetiriti based people's assembly is a form of participatory democracy that centres all demographics of the community in the decision making process. Similar processes have proven highly successful across the globe. Uh, when mayor, would you support this process and why? Kia ora. I've got, Kerry wants to have a crack at this one then, Matt. Great question. When I was chair of town planning in this town, we had several big issues. One of them was the Ring Road and the beautification of the centre of the city and so on. I invited 50 people to come into the uh, auditorium in line with your participatory democracy basis. They were given full voting rights at committee level and what you see is what you got and the community made the decisions. Thank you. So that, that's it, you're for it. For or against? Thank sorry, you. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> Matt? Matt, you just want to still get plug it in. How's that? There we go. Uh, yeah, wonderful idea. Um, has worked well overseas. Uh, comp complicated, can be expensive. So you, you don't want to use um, citizens' assemblies for everything, but you definitely want to use them for those difficult decisions, like whether or not you build a new library and where that library goes. And, and that, and I think it would be an incredibly useful tool for helping elected representatives understand what the people really want on these things. And if you haven't, uh, if you're not aware of them, look them up, Citizens Assemblies, it's a really smart system, um, and we could definitely use it here. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Uh, panel, you know, I have your next question. Oh, sorry. I apologise, did you want to have a... Yes, thank you, if I may. Yes. <laughs> um, of course, we have to be brief, so I'll use the most meaningful word, which is it's bollocks. You can't have a citizens' assembly, 
excuse me, unless you have a level playing field. And of course, people with the power to lobby, to advertise, to market, to push their perspective will have more influence than ordinary people. <coughs> excuse me, gentle people, quiet people, people who are poor, people who are busy, people who are disadvantaged will not have as much influence. There's just no way in this twisted system that ordinary people can participate because they are so disadvantaged from day one. Thanks. So you're a nay. No, I'm for it. It's a start. But it's <laughs> acknowledged that it would be better if it wasn't just run by millionaires row. Thank you for qualifying that. All right, let's go to our next question. Our next question, we'll, we'll come back to some, some good old plants and animals on this question. What further needs to be done to build ecosystem resilience for our biodiversity in Nelson? Roha, you're holding the line. Oh, thank you. Didn't even have to put my hand up. Um, so this is a, a pretty big, complicated question. Um, and I think it's where actually our partnerships with a whole lot of other organisations like DOC, like other councils, come into it. Um, but fundamentally, if we want that resiliency, we've got to give ecosystems space to thrive. Uh, and sometimes that space has to be away from us and away from our household animals. And so that means strengthening things like our existing um, sanctuary, uh, but also expanding the areas that we're working in and ramping up our trapping programs. Uh, again, this comes back to where um, chipping and snipping is going to be a really useful tool for managing wild cats, uh, but also creating biodiversity corridors throughout our city. Uh, this shouldn't be something that we just leave in, in the hinterland. Uh, our entire city can become a haven uh, using things like the halo effect and using trapping effectively to make sure that our native flora and fauna can thrive. Thank you, Rohan. Thank you. Thank you. When you're talking about resilience in the environment and ecosystem, when you've got a mature forest, you know, when they get to hundreds, even thousands of years old, that's when you get that resilience, both from a rainfall coming down, reducing that sedimentation you're talking about, also keeps the, the weeds and the pests at bay. So um, the old man's bed, a few years back now when the old man's bed was attacked, and there'd been a period of time which that wasn't. And I could see it along the Grampians moving every year about 50 metres, just strangling those canopies. And so what I pushed for, once I was Chair of Parks and Reserve, which is now Community Recreation, I pushed for a large investment, seven plus million dollars. And it took a little bit to get that across the table. Uh, but I pushed for that because of my view is if you look after the existing forest, it's all good trying to regenerate where you want, but if you look after what you've got, and that means getting rid of the likes of old man's beard, the passion fruit issues, etc., the weeds don't come through, and wildlife is a good balance there, and you don't get the pests. It's an expensive process, but once you're looking after it, it's far cheaper than trying to uh, clear some land and then regrow. As you know, with the manuka, it takes a good 20, 50 years, and then you have the, the, the beech trees coming through, and then you have the larger podocups coming through, which can take hundreds of years. But looking after your tree canopies will keep that ecosystem pretty healthy. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tim. Uh, panel, hold it for a second. Tim. Panel, would you like to prepare the next question? Next question, transport. Transport is the largest source of greenhouse gases in Nelson that the council has the ability to directly influence. How do you propose to decrease transport emissions? Great question, Nick. I am a huge fan of the revolution that is required in what is to power our vehicles. I am the proud owner of New Zealand's oldest electric car, but the electric car is no good if you're generating the power by burning coal. So what are the things that council can do to help that revolution? In the policy list that you'll have down the background, firstly, I've said over the next three years we need to double the number of charging stations within Nelson from five to ten. Secondly, council's done a good job with its own vehicles, but what about the CCOs, the port company, the airport, Nelmac? need to progressively push that. And then we need to look at what are the incentives. Here's one that I have a little bit of difficulty. Council passes a climate change emergency and then for the last three years have gotten to their petrol and diesel cars and driven home every day. 
I want to change the council's policy. We'll refund councillors and staff on their mileage if it's in a zero emissions vehicle. Now, public transport, cycleways, walkways, they are part of the mix as well. But for the majority of people that live within the Nelson region, the car will remain the predominant means of transport, and so it's so important that we change what powers them, and that is why the council needs to be more proactive in driving the electric car revolution. Thank you, thank you, Nick. Over to you, Matt. Matt's going to tell us about the council's position. Uh, no, I'm going to turn up my position. Uh, so if we all jump to, into electric cars, our roads will still be clogged, uh, our city will not become more, more livable. I have an electric car, they're not the answer. They're part of the answer, but actually the answer is us driving less as a species. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. Thank you. And the way we do that is by giving people realistic alternatives. And that means public transport that works, it means public transport that is faster than sitting in your possibly EV all by yourself at the same time as everyone else. And that means priority lanes on Waimea Road so that we can actually get people on the bus and they can get into town faster than they can driving their car by themselves. Matt, I don't disagree with the transport suggestion, but what I'm curious to is your position on vehicles owned and operated by the council as well oh, as subsidiaries. So, so interesting story. Um, Last year, I got a bit uncomfortable with the fact that elected representatives get free parking in Nelson City for as long as they like if they're on council business, but you guys all have to pay. And I thought for a council that's encouraging people not to drive, that Hang on, kind man, of I need, I need to answer the question. And so, so I don't. So I cut up my uh, my parking pass. So I think that our vehicles should be EVs and people should be discouraged from driving if they can, and we can do better. Okay, thank, thank you, Matt. Do you want to have a crack at this, Kerry? Meat? All right. Yeah. Um, Caterpillar Tractor Company has had a 40% increase in sales in the last couple of years, year on year because they're ripping the people are ripping the globe apart to find the ingredients for these batteries. So there's a trade-off here. If you want to uh, put the heat on the transport people, have a think of these statistics. 180 schools in New Zealand are still burning coal. 150 are burning diesel, and 800 are burning LPG. That's where you need to focus the attention. Tell the government, clean that up, and then we can concentrate on the transport Kerry, Kerry, can you answer the okay. question? Kerry? What's your answer to the question of transitioning the council's vehicles over to an EV fleet and its well, subsidiaries? Um, I'd say technology's got a long way to go yet before I can get too confident that it's the answer. I'll take you for a drive. <laughs> Thank you, Kerry. Do you want to add to this, Rohan? Right yeah. Just a quick, just a quick one. Uh, yes to decarbonising councils' fleets, uh, but also yes to systems-based change. Uh, and one of the other pieces of work uh, in my role in the transport space, being proud of, is laying down the framework for that to happen. We now have an active transport strategy. We have a parking strategy. We have a new public transport plan. We have all the building blocks required to make this change. And what we need in the next three years is a mayor to deliver it. Thank you, Rohan. Do you, Richard, do you want to speak to this question? Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I nearly agree with some of them. <laughs> why, why are we making all these journeys? What's each vehicle actually doing out there? You know, we. Yeah. We I can all, answer this, Richard. I've got three kids. Okay. <laughs> well, ask them because they see what's the point of these journeys. Why does Fonterra truck all this material around the country? I can tell you, football, school, the list goes on. That's not really our consumption, is it? It's the huge trucks putting the nutrition, everything good, from this country onto ships. Most of it we can't afford. How much is a metre of 4 by 2 right now? I mean, manic. A litre of milk, a piece of beef is horrifically expensive. It's not for us. It's strip mining this country and that's where our fossil fuel consumption goes in those magnificent trucks that look like spaceships 
but we can't even afford the produce that's in them. Okay, I think we'll wind up. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. All right. Can the panel ask the next question, please? This is one that I'm quite passionate about, actually. Um, so how will you support young slash youth climate activists campaigning for more climate action at local and central government? Did everyone get that? No. How do we support climate youth activism here in New Zealand? Is that fair enough? At lo a local government. And at a local government level. John Dragon? Uh, the yes, and then Rohan after you. Okay, these young people, they want integrity, don't they? They want things to make sense. They want like real answers, not our oh, hope for the market, hope for better weather, you know, hope the tourists come back kind of answers. They want real answers. This is the future they're talking about. If we want them to engage with us, then we have to provide an example with genuine integrity. And once we offer them something that does actually tick all the boxes, not just today's popular boxes of cat microchipping and electric cars, then they'll come on board in spades because it's a future worth investing in and they won't be taking their own lives and being depressed and going to counsellors. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Uh -huh. Yeah, look, we are incredibly lucky to have a whole bunch of passionate young people getting organised and getting involved to try and make change. The best thing that we as a council can do is listen to them and then start making change. They're not doing it for no reason. They're doing it because they want us to do things. Uh, so it's about sitting down and saying, right, how are we going to massively reduce our emissions in a short amount of time? How are we going to adapt to these challenges? Uh, and working with them to co-design those solutions, and not just with young people, as I said before, working with our whole community. Um, but I say, mate, keep up the pressure, uh, because the conversations we're having now are so much further along than what they were three years ago and what they were six years ago and what they were nine years ago. So thank you to our young people, not including myself in that, um, <laughs> for all of their hard work and activism bringing this conversation forward. Yeah. Would the panel like to prepare the next question? Uh, alrighty, kia ora. So this next question is um, a co-papa that's due to my heart, sewage. Um, but really it's about um, council infrastructure. So as we know, our sewage, our wastewater treatment plants are located in, you know, quite dubious locations. So all around the East Strain areas. Um, and, and this is also reference to the Nelson, there was quite a few questions that came in about wastewater treatment plants locations and the Nelson Airport as well. Um, but the question is, Nelson's sewage treatment plants are vulnerable to sea level rise. Do you think Nelson and Tasman should be planning and budgeting now to future-proof or relocate these uh, treatment plants? So it's about sea level rise as well, really. So, kia ora. The, the question is, uh, should the council be preparing investment for infrastructure in response to sea level rise? I'm actually going to throw Tim under the bus for this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Hey, very good. Hey, cheers for that. Um, no, I don't disagree with what you're saying. Um, it's something that we've got to look at long term, not just the five year or ten year plan, but the 30 year plan. And as you know, we're working very close with Iwi. We're trying to work even closer with Iwi on that because I know that's a, a passionate topic. Um, I'm, like, so I'm the deputy chair of the sewage business unit, which is a combination of TDC and NCC. Um, yes, definitely further talks on that. Uh, we've done a lot in purchasing more land just to the side there because we do a lot of spraying of the solids on the, on the trees and actually get a growth of the, of the timber there. And also looking at the reuse of that water that we, we filter out greatly and reusing that to irrigate our sports fields, golf courses, rather than using uh, the high quality potable, potable land, potable water. But you know, talking about that moving, it's a very expensive process, but yes, today, as those planning needs to be done, one of my concerns about three waters is I think it's going to go backwards because we have looked beyond five years, we've looked beyond 10 years, we've looked 30 plus years, and you may recall we put an extra $12 million in the budget for that, and I think we can put more on that. Um, my concern is under three waters handover, that very long-term planning may be removed to prioritise the issues with Wellington, etc. So that's one of those passionate environmentally, I want to keep that investment, improve that investment, and that may be that amalgamation 
thinking happens. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Tim. I've got both Kerry and Rohan who want to answer, have a crack at that question. Can I get you to keep your responses to a minute, please? You should then. Yeah. I just repeat that unless, until the climate emergency policy is clarified, it's hard to determine where this council is going, as I mentioned before. But I'll tell you this, that I haven't seen one bit of evidence that high tides are any higher than they've ever been in my lifetime. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna dispute that, mate. The science is pretty clear on that. I'll sea levels them, are I'll rising. Link after yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna. No, no, I, I, it's not coming from me, it's coming from majority of the science community. And uh, I, I believe in science, my wife is a scientist, and uh, uh, you've got to trust the science, mate. It's as simple as that. We believe in climate change. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really clear, mate. I'm sorry. It, it, go and talk to the people in Monaco and on the banks of the Maidai here by the Trafalgar Street. What, what I will say, I'll, I'll close this out with this. Look, with, with any position, any opinion, if you look far and wide enough, you'll find someone who agrees with you. It's that simple. So I'm, I'm, going, with, I'm, I'm going with majority of the scientists and the scientific community, both here in New Zealand and internationally. Can I say right Sarah Anton and answer the question? Uh, so with the wastewater treatment plant, we have two. Um, the one that is most vulnerable is Nelson North. Uh, we do actually have uh, budget for investigating potential new sites for that. That's something that I've pushed to bring forward and I think we need to accelerate the identification and purchase of a future site for that area. Um, weirdly enough, it doesn't look at, but Bells Island's actually relatively okay. It really depends on how we uh, act in the next 10, 20 and 30 years in our mitigation uh, actions as to whether or not we're also going to have to relocate that site as well. Thank you, Rohan. All right, panel. Next question, please. Uh, that's a really good question about infrastructure. I'm going to bring it on to housing. So how can we address Nelson's housing needs without wholesale urban sprawl in our few remaining green spaces? And how could council make it more attractive for developers to take on intensification projects in the city? I've got, I've got a yes from both Nick and Matt, who were first off the bat. Matt? So, so, when else is city, right? We're going to start looking and acting like a city and less like a sprawling regional town. We need to start going up. And there have been arguments over the last two terms of council about how, how high we should go, but every time we've pushed it a little bit, like on the site of the old organic greengrocers, like we had to go a bit higher than some people were comfortable with, it works. That's the way we need to go, that's the future. And an idea that I've been pushing is that we should look at the airspace above these massive squares that we have in the middle of our city. We have these huge, incredibly valuable slabs of land and all we do with them is we allow people to store temporarily their private property, cars, for not much money. And that's all we do with them. I'm saying, let, pe let people keep parking on the ground floor, let's look at building in the airspace above. Retain the ground floor for public parking, have warm, dry homes right in the middle of town for Nelsonians in the space above. This idea has got a lot of attention. People like Bill Mackay from the um, Auckland University School of Architecture is crazy about it. I really hope that I get, as mayor, in the next term to explore this great idea. Thank, Thank you, you Matt. Nick? Could you please pass up? Thank you. I'm going to get you to keep your response to a minute, Nick, if that's right. Nick, really, you... really hard to do justice to an issue as complex as housing, urban development and the like in a minute. Uh, my view is actually it is a mix of up, and I'm proud as Minister to use my powers to allow the Betts car park development, the ocean multi-storey development, uh, retirement villages, apartments, townhouses in the mix. Council is only a small part of the mix. Here's the one thing that we've got to do, of which I've been very specific in my commitment. Multi-storey developments in the city is unlikely to result in more affordable housing. We are so fortunate to have the Nelson Tasman Housing Trust. We didn't gain much from selling the uh, pensioner cottages from the council to the government. That didn't house a single person. But we've got 12 million in the tin. We should use it to supercharge our community housing sector. And I've committed to double that number of houses from 50 to 100 over the next three years. And in my view, we should aim to double it again 
to get that affordable housing. Uh, Kerry, would you like to speak to this as well, just quickly? The Resource Management Act is a vague document. If it could be made more specific, I'm sure we could make the system much more efficient. But as it is, it has added at least 30% to the cost of a, of a finished product in today's terms. And that's, and that's big money. Yeah, not just that, so yes, the cost has increased. The question is, are you for or against uh, urban intensification or city oh, intensification? No. Uh, intensification within certain zones, certainly, but not generally. I'm dead against that. So you're for spreading out sideways? Actually, we're both. No, okay. <laughs> Alright, next question from the panel, please. Oh, sorry, no, I apologise. Did you want to have a crack at that, Richard? Yes, of course, sorry, mate. Yeah, I misunderstood that. Please yeah, go for it. Can we just back up a bit and do we really need more bloody concrete? structures. I don't think we do. In the 1970s, you know, there was an average of five people living in a small house. Now it's down to 1.9 people living in great big sprawling glass and concrete things with huge TV screens. And of course, everybody's lonely. Communities are shattered. Family are far away. You know, where does our mental health problems come from? Where do our anxiety problems come from? Why do we need to transport so much? Why do we need to buy so many carpets and TVs and chairs and tables and jugs? Because we're all being separated all the time. When what we really yearn for is to be with the people that love us. Mostly in the vicinity of where we grew up. And building more and more and more, it suits the money thing, doesn't it? But in the meantime, we're consuming more resources, more fossil fuel, more, res more uh, climate impacts with concrete and production and manufacturing and transport, All right. packaging. Nah, don't want to be in a bit. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Is there anyone else that would you want to speak to that as well? Uh, yeah, well, I wasn't sure where, whether I was going to agree with Richard when he started, but um, I, I do agree that actually we do need uh, more intensification. And we need, but we do need more homes. We know that as a fact. Um, and what we can do through that intensification is one, we know that if we continue to allow significant greenfield expansion, uh, the economics don't add up for building up. We actually need to limit greenfield expansion if we want to see intensification. But also if we want our city to be affordable, and in terms of rates, the more we sprawl out as a city, the more our infrastructure and transport costs go up, whilst our rating base does not increase at the same rate. So if we want an affordable city, we actually have to be a compact city as well. Yeah, here, here. Uh, Now we're, we're approaching, we've got eight more minutes panel. Would you like to pull out your, uh, some of your best questions for the next few? Okay. A clarity question, speed of change and leadership. The United Nations panels on climate change have clearly indicated that in order to keep temperature rises below 1.5 degrees centigrade, we need to reduce emissions by around about 50% between now and 2030. That is a very strong demand and very difficult to achieve. It needs leadership. The question is, in an environment where the council is encouraging change, is its role to lead change or just quietly sit by and somebody else leads it? That is a really good question. I've got a very passionate response here. Um, the So Richard, then Matt. Yep. And, uh, one minute guys, we're going to try and smash through some answers and get as much as we can out of the rest of the evening. Yeah, great, great, proper real questions now. This is life or death stuff, isn't it? And it's a massive change and no little tweaking is going to make massive change, is it? And I think absolutely the position, these government positions, these local authority positions are pivotal in the spear tip of our sentiment, of our vision. You need somebody who's way out in advance thinking which way are we actually going to guide this thing. And it ain't back there, it's out at the front. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. So we actually have to lead, but we also have to get re-elected if we're going to lead. 
So it's really important how we do it, and I do not believe that terrifying people with stories about climate change works. Human beings, we're wonderful, but we're, we're pretty weird in many ways. We're good at dealing with uh, threats that are right in front of us, saber toothed tigers, that kind of thing, pretty good. Things that are a little bit down the track, we're hopeless. We're just not wired for it. So I think, I think frightening people, I think frightening people, I'm speaking for myself, Richard. So I think, I think trying try to frighten people into change isn't going to work. You know? And you also get chucked out at the next election. So what you need to do is you need to promote things that make people's lives better, that make the city more livable, and get you climate wins at the same time. That's the way you do it. And a great example is Te Ara Whakatū, the Nelson Spatial Plan, which will enable more people living in town, it will enable better uh, active transport, it will mean more plants and trees growing in our city. That's the way you do it, that's leadership. So, lead from the front, Matt. Okay. Leading from the front. Leading from the front. All right, Nick. Firstly, if you are going to carry these big arguments over climate change, you need to be open with people about the scale of the challenge and your different roles. If the mayor tells you that they are going to solve the climate change problem in Nelson, they are pulling your leg. If they are telling you that they are doing nothing, they are equally negligent. Be honest about what council can do, what government needs to do, what individuals need to do, what business needs to do, and what we need to do globally. Lastly, lead with practical action and less overblown rhetoric and provide hope, because on which I agree with Matt, is that if we keep telling our young people it's all doom and gloom, my view is actually we are doing a disservice. I am an optimist, despite the challenges, that we can get there with effectively community action together. Leading from the front, next. Thank you. All right, panel. Yes. Oh yeah, so um, this question is actually quite contentious, and we have actually heard from T Tim about his perspectives around three waters. So, so the question is, are you for or against three waters? And if you are, how do you think this would help the environment? Are you for or against three waters, is the question, and how does it relate to the environment? I'll go Nick then, Matt. Yeah, I'm very strongly opposed to three waters either from an economic and engineering or a practical background. From an engineering background, three waters will result in confused management of the very events that we've lasted. If there's anything about water, it's that you need to manage it in an integrated way. Having a Wellington outfit being responsible for part of the pipes and the local council responsible for the footpath and the other bits is only going to result in a mess. Secondly, economically, it is particularly bad for Nelson. It effectively has lower income people in Nelson paying for the richest city in the country, Wellington, and having to fix up their problems. Even the Auditor General says that the model proposed has poor accountability and transparency. I'm concerned that our Nelson Council has been one of only three that has supported a reform that is actually not good for Nelson or for water management. Thank you, Nick. Matt? Thanks. So, um, we're a first world country, we should have first world water. You know, our water should be safe, we should uh, know that it's going to be safe uh, across the country, and we should know that it'll be safe for future generations. That's, that's what you should have in a first world country. Now, I applaud the government for actually trying to do something about the state of water in Aotearoa, New Zealand. They haven't done a particularly good job, but at least they're having a go. Now, if we were going to vote on the current model, and it's a big if, because this is the thing everyone needs to understand, we don't get to choose about three waters. This is being done to us. Okay? But if, hypothetically, I got, to I got to vote on it, I wouldn't vote for this model, because we shouldn't be grouped with the North Island. We should be part of a South Island entity. That makes, it makes no sense for us to be grouped with Wellington and uh, places like Gisborne. And uh, stormwater, LGNZ degrees, should not be part of it. That should remain locally managed because it affects so much of what council does. So yes for reform, not for the model that's being proposed right now, 
but I hope they get something that works better because we do need change. Thank you, Matt. Well done. Huh? Uh, I'd endorse everything uh, that Matt's just said. Uh, the reality is we don't have direct control of this, um, and the fact is that in the next decade, if all of our uh, Three Waters infrastructure stays with Council and nothing changes, we will be faced with a bill of replacement pipes that I don't think we can pay. Uh, we're talking upwards of $500 million. We're looking at Stoke uh, needing almost wholesale replacement of their infrastructure. Uh, for a whole lot of people tell us they want to keep rates down. They also tend to tell us to stop Three Waters. I haven't figured out how they've done the maths on that. Uh, but what I am committed to as Mayor is working with the government to try and get this model to something that works. They have been clear that they are committed to seeing it through, and so what we must do now is advocate to get the best outcome for our region, not just needlessly hold up a sort of Winston Peters no sign uh, and hope that it goes away. Thank you, Robert. Now we've got, I'd like the panel to prepare their last and final question because we've actually just hit 8pm this evening. I'm very keen to be timely for the audience here. So if the panel would like to take a minute to prepare their best question. Oh, a second. I'm, I'm trying to be... Uh, a second. Okay. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be right. There is, there is one that we want to go with. Um, I think we're going to go with this one. This is one that's probably a little bit quiet to finish up with, but it's really important for us. So in terms of everything that goes on in the natural environment, um, planning is one of the most important issues. It's not cool, it's not often sexy, but it's actually really important. So in December 2021, Nelson City Council decided to pause the release of the Whakamahiri Hakatū Nelson Plan. This plan was a combined regional policy statement and resource management plan. It was paused due to the changes that would be required following government reformatting of the RMA, the Climate Adaptation Act, new environmental standards and the NPSIB as some of those things. If you are elected Mayor, how will you, will you prioritise completion of this planning document or how are you going to proceed with the Nelson plan? Who wants a bite of that one? Tim, Tim, Tim's jumping out of the skin to answer it. Hey, that was a long, a long question, but you know, whether we're probably, yes, definitely, I've been pushing the Nelson plan has hindered us from not progressing. It's a big task, and I know the staff are working incredibly hard on it, but we have been held back. In one of the areas I've said we've really pushed the Air plan. I was pushing very hard to at least get the air plan done. We're talking about the climate, etc., and the coastal plan. Um, yes, that would be a priority. When it comes to investment, I'm saying we've been investing in the going to invest in the library, etc. I think there's other things that's more important, like progressing that Nelson plan, which is a very broad. It's a big topic, as you've covered there. But yes, I mean it's easy for me to say yes, yes let's do it. But I need a council around the table supporting me, supporting the staff and resourcing the staff and that resources is what just, which is what has held us back. The staff work incredibly hard on that and I know they've been working tirelessly but it has been held back and I need a council, if I'm mayor, I need a council behind me that will support our staff and CEO to get that done. Thank you. Thank you Tim. Rohan's going to have a crack at this and then panel, I want one more question. Come on, give me another one. I want another meaty one to throw at these people. All right. So I've got to disagree with the panel slightly. Planning is incredibly sexy. Um, it is the building blocks of our city and it's something I've engaged very strongly on. Um, right now we are in a space of uncertainty uh, with the changes to the Resource Management Act or in its complete overhaul. Um, what we are doing is we're progressing a housing plan change that also covers a lot of our natural hazards as well. That's something I'm really keen to push on, but also to lead conversations with the government to say, actually, if you want to deliver to your own priorities, you need to give local government certainty for how we're going to get through this. We invested uh, millions of dollars into the Nelson plan uh, just to be told shortly before notification that we're probably not going to get it done. Um, and that sort of lack of communication between local and central government 
is where we see a lot of waste and a lot of um, broken trust and broken promises. And so strengthening our relationship with Wellington is going to be a key role of your next mayor and something I'm committed to leading. Thank you, Rohan. All right, would the panel like to ask another question? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so this is a pretty broad one. Um, <clears throat> what are your top three priorities to address the climate crisis? So that's just broad, your top three priorities when it comes to addressing the climate crisis. That's a great question. With you, Nick, one minute. Your top three priorities. One, stop coal being more being burnt in the city, it's a bygone fuel, it is the worst of our climate change polluters. Two is double the number of electric charging stations and is courage as rapidly as possible the expansion of the electric car network. Three, improve the biking, walking and public transport elements of our community to give people the choice of different transport services. Thank you, Nick. Tim. We're just going to run down the panel. Yeah, Everybody's going to have a crack. Broad, broad question, but uh, housing, I think, plays a big part in that, and where you put the housing, how you build it, etc. Um, looking after, I've touched on that before, looking after established forests. You can spend a lot of minute money trying to re-establish forests, but look after what you've got. Um, and the other thing is, look at consumerism. Uh, when it comes to a lot of our impact on the planet and the resources, is that consumerism. We want to bring brand new, different colours here now or yesterday and I think we've got to re-look at reusing our bits and pieces, a bit like our parents, our grandparents did, they, they sewed on the button back on the shirt, they made use of their um, composting etc, chickens, I think that consumerism we've got to change that mindset for and that probably aligns a little bit with what uh, Richard was talking about. Thank you. Thank you Tim, I will, I will jump in there and say um, with consumerism something like 70% of products bought at warehouse end up in landfill within 12 months. Wow. We'll leave you with that thought. All right, next candidate, please. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, the first thing, and I said this in 2013 in the Nelson Mail on the front page in my closing address to Rachel when, when she won that contest, borrow as much money as you need to do the right thing because the money doesn't exist. It's pretend. And after that, it's easy. Pay for everything that you need, that you know is the right thing. If the people need it, start with the people that are at the bottom, who are really desperate, and the rest takes care of itself. And we'll soon forget all about the money and just be like a ghastly piece of history as we emerged from barbarity into enlightenment. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Richard. One modal shift, uh, it makes up 94% of our region's emissions, decarbonising our transport network and supporting people to choose public transport and active transport. Number two, urban design and intensification, supporting a compact, walkable city with high quality, energy efficient and affordable homes. And three, adaptation and resiliency, planning now for the effects that we know we're likely to see. Thank you, Rohan. Yep. I can only repeat, you need a clear plan with clear directions on where you want to go with this issue. It's such an important issue, and yet when you look at the plan, clearly it's, it's obscure to the point that you can build a library at sea level, but you've got to tell everybody else to clear out onto higher ground. How ridiculous is that? <laughs> no, no more points, just one point. Okay, Matt. Uh, so three points um, common to other speakers. Uh, transport, 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 transport would be three, but um, just getting those electric buses going next year and getting Nelsonians on them and getting kids and students on them for free will go a big way. Uh, creating a more compact city so people don't have to use uh, you know, motor vehicles to live would also be a great step forward. And, and actually three, um, the waterfront. Actually having a waterfront that is built for the effects of climate change that gives us greater resilience around there and greater security 
and creates this four and a half metre wide space for people to be able to walk and cycle around the waterfront would be a wonderful thing because we should be encouraging e-bikes over EVs. Um, Nelson's the perfect place for this sort of thing. We can do it. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Okay, that concludes our questions for this evening. Now, I'd just like to, um, I'm all for a quick, hey, hey, don't stand up and start walking off yet. Um, I'm all for a quick wrap-up. First of all, I would just like to thank our partners, Forest and Bird, the book, Waimarama Sanctuary, Nelson Tasman Climate Forum and Nelson Environment Centre, of which I'm from. Uh, I would like to thank our panellists. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for this evening. I would like to thank our candidates for all taking the time to come here this evening and answer your questions. I would like to thank uh, Nelson City Council and Founders Park for this great venue that we're at. I would like to thank Sam from RNZ who's hiding behind there recording the event for the news. Um, I would like to thank our food and beverage donors, Chia Sisters, Sublime Coffee, Oakland and Proper Crisps. Please grab a pack of crisps on the way out. Um, Lastly, I would like to thank my team. They're amazing. They made tonight happen. They're the ones behind us in the background. Without their great work, we wouldn't exist. So a huge round of applause for them, please. And last, oh no, no. And lastly, I want to thank you. Because people tend to forget if it wasn't for our community here, these fine folks wouldn't have an opportunity to lead us. So thank you all for making time to come here this evening. And thank you to Anton. Well, give it up for Anton. <laughs>